G'day guys, in this video I'm going to be very briefly summarizing the main formulas you can expect to see in a standard first year dynamics course. So these two formulas here are your velocity vector, which is defined as your derivative of your position vector with respect to time, and this is your acceleration vector, which is defined as your time derivative of your velocity vector. So to make that a little bit clearer, if we have some particle which is swooping out some complicated path like this, then at any particular time t, it will have a position vector r, a velocity vector which is tangential to the path v, and some acceleration vector a. Now it turns out from these two formulas and a few other assumptions, we can derive the formulas for projectile motion and circular motion. If we assume that a particle has no acceleration on it other than the acceleration due to gravity, which is entirely downwards, then ax will be equal to zero and ay will be equal to minus g in which case these following formulas can be derived. Now in this formula, vx0 and vy0 are your initial velocities at time t is equal to zero. This is vx0, this is vy0. And x0 and y0 are your initial positions of your projectile at time t is equal to zero. Now let's quickly talk about circular motion. If we have a particle that's swooping out a circular path, then at any particular time t, the velocity will be tangent to the path, and its magnitude will be given by r omega, where r is the radius of the circle, and omega is your angular velocity, d theta dt. Now at any particular time t, the particle will also have an acceleration, which will have two components, a tangential component, at, and a normal component, which will always face towards the center of the circle, an. The magnitude of at is alpha r, where alpha is your angular acceleration, and it's given by d omega dt. An is given by the formula v squared on r, where v is your speed, just here. And you can prove that this is also written as omega squared r. Now let's quickly talk about friction. If we're trying to drag a block across a rough surface, there will always exist a friction force which will act to try and oppose this motion. If it's true that the block is already moving, then the friction force will remain constant, and it will be f is equal to mu k n, where mu k is your kinetic coefficient of friction, which is dimensionless, and n is your normal force acting on the block from the ground. However, if the block is stationary, then there are a range of friction forces that can exist, such that the acceleration of the block is zero but the maximum possible friction force that can exist is mu s n, where mu s is known as your static coefficient of friction. Now let's quickly talk about relative motion. If we've got two particles, say a and b, and they're swooping out their own paths, then we can say that the position of a from some fixed axis, let's say it's here, is gonna be equal to the position of b plus the position of a relative to b. And if it's true if we have no rotating relative axes, then we can say that the velocity of a is going to be equal to the velocity of b plus the velocity of a relative to b. Likewise, we can differentiate once again to show that the acceleration of a is equal to the acceleration of b plus the acceleration of a relative to b. And just for clarity, I've shown that in this particular case, you can solve for the velocity of a relative to b graphically by showing the velocity of a just here, the velocity of b just here, and connecting the triangle like this. So in this case, the velocity of a relative to b looks like that. Now let's quickly talk about rigid body motion. If we have some rigid body like this, and there's a whole bunch of external forces acting on this thing, then the sum of these external forces is gonna be equal to the total mass of your rigid body times by your acceleration of your center of mass. So that'll help you find the acceleration of the center of mass, but how will you find out how this body rotates under the action of these forces? Well, we can use these two formulas. We know that the sum of moments about point G of all of these forces is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia of your rigid body about point G times by your angular acceleration. Or alternatively, you can use this formula, which states that the sum of moments about point O, where O is some point which is not accelerating or fixed, right, is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia of your rigid body calculated about point O times by the angular acceleration of your rigid body. All right, let's talk about moment of inertia in a little bit more detail. 
Moment of inertia is defined by the following formula, the integral of r squared dm, and it's quite analogous to mass. It's just a property of the mass distribution of your, of your rigid body. And one way you can find moment of inertia is by using the parallel axis theorem, given that you know the moment of inertia of its center of mass already. Here, consider an I-beam. Let's, let's say we want to find out the moment of inertia of this I-beam about point P. We can do that by applying the parallel axis theorem, which states that IP is equal to IG plus MD squared, where M is the mass of your I-beam, and D is the distance between our two parallel axes. Lastly, let's quickly talk about work energy. This states that the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy plus the change in elastic energy is equal to the work done on your system, where work is defined as the integral of f dot dr. Let's consider kinetic energy first, which has two components for rigid bodies. It has your translational kinetic energy and your rotational kinetic energy. M, V2, and V1 are your mass, your initial speeds, and your final speeds. Now in this term, Ig is your moment of inertia about your center of mass, and omega 1 and omega 2 are your initial and final angular velocities of your rigid body. Now let's consider potential energy. Well, Y1 and Y2 are your initial and final heights of your center of mass of your object, defined from some axis you choose. And lastly, let's talk about your change in elastic energy. K is your spring stiffness, and L1 and L2 are the amounts your spring has been stretched or compressed from its equilibrium positions at its initial and final times. Now, lastly, if your work done by non-conservative forces happens to be zero, then you can say that this left-hand side expression will be equal to zero, which means you have something called the conservation of mechanical energy. Anyway, guys, I hope that made sense. I hope that summary was useful to you. Cheers.